Later that day as the weather clears up, Jiwon walks through the yard with Siren. She makes a fuss over the fact that he challenges the monarchs knowing well he will step down as the fortress master tomorrow. She adds if he wants to destroy the narrow gate he should have done it quietly, instead of making such a huge mess about it and challenging the pitch darkness monarch. Though knowing the almighty land is at war at the moment, Jiwon assumes someone at the rank of supreme monarch can't leave. He explains further that he expects at least two or three monarchs might come, as well as the people of the five great clans. Only then, Jiwon will have the chance to change the situation completely. Right after, Siren goes back to the business she came to do. She asks what Jiwon gets from the eight gates of hell, so he tells her bits and pieces. What's her grandfather, Molark, left in there? But she is skeptical, so he reveals a story starting with a cold winter. The egg that Molark picked up at the Winter of Illusion Tree, that's in the sixth region. It was at the base of it, in that vicious land where a civious ice storm would occur. An egg that was shining brilliantly was waiting for Molark. At that time, he was extremely nervous because that was the first time in his life that he had picked up an egg. He could never forget the sprouting of an existence that is born by eating dreams and dreaming again. The moment he saw the face of the child that woke up from within the shell, he realized that his godmother's words were correct. Jiwon moves closer to her, adding how such a child that was just born is so lovely, out of nowhere making Siren blushes, so Jiwon thinks that it should probably be enough proof for her. While Siren is fuming about the fact that he speaks of Molark's memories like his own. Based on that though, Jiwon says that the mares seem to all be born from the egg. As Siren asks, Jiwon explains that the winter base of the illusion tree is at the northern base in the almighty land. She asks further whether Molark left something for her, but Jiwon doesn't really understand it. The memories that Jiwon saw weren't in the form of a book, it was more like a cluster of extremely complicated memories. A glimpse of fragmented memories where one can't tell what is the beginning or the end. So Jiwon can't really tell her anything specific even though he wants to, as Siren fuses him off about what a scammer he is. He then offers her to come with him on his journey, knowing that she wants to know Molark's memories and since he disappeared in the abyss where Jiwon is going next. That pisses Siren off, being tricked and all after knowing that this asshole was making a fool of her. But then it dawns on her, the records that her godfather left behind was in the form of memories. A naughty smile appears on her face, saying that she has a really good idea. Right after they go to Siren's workshop, as Jiwon is teasing her after that fuss she made about not letting him in there ever again. Even after she went about how he was invading her personal life, making her even more embarrassed as she prepares her stuff. Once she is done, the ceiling opens up and drops a massive sexual fetish tool. With a naughty laugh she explains that it will help them with the squeeze. She adds, normally squeeze is something that mares that have lost spiritual sense do very often. Since it's and that allows one to condense overall emotions, memories and enlightenment as well as experience them. Mares would have no lack of ideas for a while after they experience squeeze once. Jiwon quickly goes for it, telling her to be quick about it. A naughty smile appears on Siren's face, wondering whether he can still remain so relaxed after the squeeze starts. She is frantically laughing as the process starts, a bunch of her magic emerge and the squeeze is starting. Surprisingly she experiences more pain than Jiwon is. Even though she expects this, his mental power is way more powerful than she had imagined as her magic starts to envelop them in a circling violet brilliant light. At the next moment, she wakes up in a pool of Jiwon's sea of consciousness. It is filled with balls of memories surprising her with the sheer amount of it a mere human can have. Back when Jiwon broke the eight gates of hell, she did think he wasn't ordinary but looking at the sea of memories Jiwon had, it is beyond what she can handle. Being lost in thought, a memory sphere bumps into her, a reminder for her to pull herself together if she doesn't want to get trapped in his consciousness. She starts moving, looking for the sphere that contains the memories inside the eighth gate of hell. But the memory spheres are too many and one by one they start to bump and obstruct her movement. Being helpless, she deploys her magic and starts flying through the maze of the memories. She dashes through and finally finds it, a massive golden sphere that contains memory Jiwon has while inside the gate. She sees it, a memory of their memory when she was a child building a mock tower to play around. Even though it's inside of a memory, Molark is able to notice her and asks her to come. She cries her eyes out trying to reach him, saying how long it has been for her to find him after he is gone. Drowned in emotions, she goes into the golden memory sphere without being aware of it. A moment later she wakes up, getting welcomed by a busy city full of lights. She wonders where she is, as she alters her appearance looking around the seemingly normal city with a grim atmosphere around it. While she wanders around, she remembers the 294th world called Earth, the place where mares visit from time to time by riding on the illusion tree. Thanks to the desperate efforts of the predecessor mares to protect Earth, it remains hidden from the rulers for a long time. 
She also remembers how Malark explained to her that within an existence, there exists a subconsciousness known as Uncanny. It is made from the hometown of the target, and all illusions of the world are made with Uncanny as the base. Reminding her, if she ever falls into Uncanny there's only one way to get out which is to find the guide, who only has consciousness within the subconsciousness. She keeps wondering about it as a child running through her, telling her to get out of his way. The child is getting chased out by police as he comes to the end of the alley and the police tell him to give up. Instead of surrendering, he raises his steel pipe ready for a fight. Suddenly Siren screams, telling them to stop. They notice her as a citizen and explain to her that this kid has refused to become a grown-up. One of them adds that it's a great offense that warrants executions and it's supposedly natural for them to go after him. That leaves Siren speechless. But on the other hand, the other police officer notices that Siren speaks weirdly as well as wearing weird clothes. So they start asking questions to her, on top of Siren's horn starts showing from her poor attempt to conceal it. It dawns on her, about how Malark warned her that she must not do anything that makes her stand out in a world that rejects the uncanny. Because if she ever shows an appearance that's different from others in said world, no one knows what will happen to her. So there's no other choice for her but to muster up her magical power summoning a massive fireball to drive them away with it. Surprise to her, as it turns out that she is impotent in this world and her magic isn't coming out. On top of that, the officers start transforming into a beast, as notification is glaring out that an alien substance has been discovered in this world. The world systems proceed exterminating immediately as the monsters start their attack. Without her magic, Siren is helpless against them and will only be depicted with a tragic end. Suddenly one of them that grabs Siren gets hit by the kid. One that looks so beaten up, seems to fight all the time endlessly. He jumps around, and in an instant beats the monsters up. What Siren thinks is correct now, the only consciousness within the subconsciousness is the guide. The guide of Uncanny is supposed to be the reflection of Ego's mental age and this kid might be it. Once he is done dealing with them, they start getting away together, sneaking around the back of the building and through tight spots and all, while Siren observes how those kids' sharp eyes and face that says how stubborn he is. Must have been Jiwon when he was young. But the fact that reflects the Ego's mental age has that appearance can only mean Jiwon's mental age is totally that of a kid. This tiny adorable Yiwa is helping Siren go through the gap of the building as they talk about the fact that it's the first time a living being like Siren visits this world, though she keeps wondering why he would stay in a world like this, a world where everyone is an adult and keeps trying to kill kids who refuse to become an adult. In his childish tone, he simply blurts out an innocent answer and simply refuses to become an adult. Somehow, he is cutely curious about what kind of person he is outside. That's weirdly giving Siren a hard time describing Jiwon to this tiny and cute version of him who wonders if he is an adult on the outside. While he blushes wondering about it, she refutes that by saying that Jiwon is a child on the outside. Siren is happy looking at how cute this Jiwon licking her story is. He then brushes her hair, saying that he will send her out along with the memory fragment that came in together buried in her hair. She asks how he knows to do that, so he explains that's what he does, to return memories that have lost their way to their original place. He adds that seeing how it's read, the memory must be a very important and urgent one. And if he doesn't return it back to its original place soon, the outside Jiwon might be in trouble. Though, there is a hiccup where he can only send her back with it, only when the passageway is open. So they start trading questions while evading the adults around, finding a place to sleep under the bridge when the night comes, looking for signals of the passageway during the day, and stealing food to survive. Their dynamic relationship is adorable and makes Siren wonder whether this Jiwon is okay despite living a life like that. The horrible experience and wounds that Jiwon suffered his nature that refused to bend his knees despite having through such an arduous journey are what's created this world. Before long, it's been a week for them to keep looking for a signal without luck inside this world. That makes her wonder whether he only returns memories to their place. It turns out that he doesn't and takes out a white memories that he keeps holding on to. Siren has the urge to check whether it is really okay for him to keep it and he shows her how to replay the memory by touching it. A film roll appears from it, enveloping them with a bunch of memories from G1's childhood. He was with his mom when she was reading him the story about The Little Prince, a famous book that's a must-read even among the mares. The book is about the little prince seeing the world with his own eyes. It's a beautiful story of the prince who trusts the power of his imagination and treasures his innocence. The end of that beautiful story is the death of the little prince, an ending that needs to happen because the only that can remain innocent are those that die. But Jiwon's mother tells him the little prince isn't actually dead and keeps living happily on earth. As innocent smiles appear on this cute little Jiwon reliving those memories again. While Siren well knows that is an obvious lie. The fact that the little prince didn't give up on the world has become a source of power that supports Jiwon in his journey. His world that was birthed after he faced the oppression of the system. 
although it still hasn't gotten any decent plausible, elaborate worldview or creative background, it doesn't compromise or submit to anyone. That moment where his world was born in the world after the end, making Siren wonders why such a memory is on a white fragment. Then just what kind of memories do one has to forget in order to survive? At that moment the device finally gets a signal on something, so little Jiwon immediately runs off. He tells her to run as well, because the passageway is starting to open. And a massive hole appears in the sky, captivating Siren's eyes with the majestic display of such an event she has been waiting for. Witnessing it, little Jiwon tells her that it will open up completely soon. Unfortunately for them, the adults in this world start becoming monsters right after seeing the passageway open up. Little Jiwon beats his way through the mob, while he explains that the passageway is a foreign existence that doesn't supposedly exist in this world. As it wasn't bad enough, they need to get to the rooftop before it disappears. Little Jiwon slips up and a monster manages to grab him, but his strong tenacity proves to be tenacious so he fights back beating around the dead that come his way. Siren is surprised to see how little Jiwon is not even scared even in such a situation, as he screams at her to get on the elevator. This is Jiwon's ego after all, for him they don't actually exist. Those are just numbers, and only just rules the adults of this world decided on while he swiftly beats the dead up. Right after he clears the way up, they run up the stairs and go for the exit to the rooftop. As he holds the doors, he tells Siren to go knowing that the passageway is going to start to close soon. But Siren doesn't want him to be left alone in this fucked up world and asks him to come with her. He can't do that, claiming this place is his world and he must remain here. So he pushes her to quickly go, making Siren run in repulsive anger brewing in her heart. Before she leaves, little Jiwon asks whether he has any friends in the outside world. She is sad, which makes her want to tell Jiwon about this kid. When he feels an unbearable loneliness and thinks he can no longer go on, Siren will let him know the version of the little prince that he knows wasn't wrong. Because that little prince that she saw didn't give up on his world no matter what. In the next moment, she finally went back to the canal of memories. At this moment, she needs to give up finding her grandfather's memories. But she feels like gained something more and when she goes back, she will be able to make a good tower. For the time being, she decides to follow Jiwon on his expedition. Right after she opens up the red memory fragment, it starts with Mullark walking in a hall full of blood. A shock of horror appears on Siren's eyes, witnessing a sinister smile rise. It turns out Mullark is meeting with Catastrophe. While it's true that one must meet Catastrophe in order to go to the Abyss, it's not necessary to fight him. In the first place, it's not even possible in the first place. Knowing that, Siren now knows that she must go back to reality as fast as possible because Jiwon needs this in order to go to the Abyss. The most important thing is to stop Jiwon from fighting catastrophe so he doesn't throw all the people's life away along with their hope with it. While Siren is inside the canal of memories, she is getting dragged around by Kaiman. On reality world, it has been another 900 years and Jiwon with his people have already made their way toward the last gate that leads to the abyss. As Jiwon claims that he saw this gate, takes the form of a factory he witnessed in Mullark's records of the abyss. Even though he already told the expedition party repeatedly that not all of them can go into the abyss if they come along, there is still a total of more than 3,000 people that came along. Since the abyss expedition is a long time dream of chaos, these people won't listen even if he tried to stop them from coming. But the mare he has to carry around is a headache, after she charges into a squeeze and still isn't awake. But she might be useful, so he can't just leave her at the fortress. Suddenly the hangar is opening up, and a pack of horned beasts come out from it. With their bloodshot eyes they charge forward looking to prey on the mob of humans that are trying to get in. Kaiman reaches for his sword, commanding the army to prepare for battle. Meanwhile at the ninth region of ancient palace of pitch darkness, Reika is kneeling, reporting everything to black strategist Sam Eung Han about what went down in chaos as well as how Garam went down. The five dragon brothers are dead, on top of the major generals as well as his blood family, the hidden sent monarch, Sam Eung Garam is dead. But a mere brigadier general like Reika survived. Fears rain down on him as the mere pressure from Sam Eung Han is so powerful. Compared to Jiwon back then, the level difference is way too big. He doesn't punish Raker right away, instead he tells him that a few days ago he traveled to the route. He wants to show what he brings out from that place. He brings back a weird teacup painting. Explaining that the artwork is outstanding isn't because it's painting. He brags about how the artist drew a teacup, yet mentioned it isn't one. He grabs Reka, repeatedly saying that's not a teacup, just a drawing that looks like a teacup. There are countless teacups in the world, and all of them look different. Yet, they are called teacups. After thinking repeatedly about this, he arrives at a certain question about what a real teacup is. Does such a thing even really exist? Eventually, Sam Eung Han came to question what a monarch is. This ambiguous question is too confusing for Reika. Sam Eung Han comes back to business, telling him how he came back alone after losing all of his comrades and failing to destroy a single product. 
In the end, Sam Ung Yoon executes him and a pool of blood flows down the stairs. The next thing in his mind is where the Chaos people are right now, pointing out that they might be at the strange factory. So he commands his men to prepare to depart for battle and come down themselves to teach that bastard the price of his arrogance. Sam Ung Han walks down to his study while thinking about how World 296 called Earth that he finds himself liking it even more. As it turns out the teacup art is not the only thing he brings back from the tree root. A man chained up in the ceiling, Jiwon's real body from Earth. He recalled how Jiwon challenged his courage to die. So Sam Ung Han is excited to see whether Jiwon has the courage to stop. Ice Monarch called Vargas comes to his door. Regarding the narrow gate that has been closed he asks how they are able to come to chaos. Evil smiles appear on Sam Ung Han's face, explaining that they need to kill themselves to go. And the first person he wants to go there is Vargas the Ice Monarch. At this moment, the fight from the fortress's army is fiercely going on with the Horned Beast. In the next moment, a massive energy blast flies off above Kaiman's head. Both Kaiman and Chung are amazed looking at how powerful that is, no matter how many times they see that. That makes Kaiman feel a little down that he wouldn't be able to go with Jiwon. On the other hand, Jiwon is concerned about his spirit weapon. Even after eating a whole lot of horn, it isn't getting repaired easily. That's just how damaged it had gotten from the fight with Samyung Garam. Though, if it weren't a spirit weapon that is able to regenerate itself, it would have been better to just make a new sword. And based on what Michael said, spirit weapons go through three big evolutions. Every time it evolves, it will obtain great strength or have an exponential increase of abilities. A sudden pressure of power from a mere scream emerges, as a sinister pair of eyes look out from the hangar. A beast with eight horns, an octahorn dashes his way out rampaging around. Like a reign of sorrow, the expedition party is dubious to fight such a thing because to kill an octahorn they need at least someone at brigadier general level. Furious at the loss of its comrades, the Octahorn sets its eyes on Jiwon and charges a massive power sphere and shoots it towards Jiwon. Kainan is worried somehow, but Chungha turns up to him, asking whether Kaiman is seriously worried about Jiwon after what's all he has done. True to the old man's words, Jiwon pulls out power from his awakened world. He releases a massive thrust meeting the mana blast from the Octahorn. The attack meets, sending a massive shockwave around, surprising Kaiman with how Jiwon has gotten even stronger than before. The thrust went through the octahorn and it shows how powerful the power of the awakened that opened up Genesis. Jiwon climbs up to its corpse, taking the beast for its horn. Suddenly a voice screams out from the factory, telling Jiwon to put down Garnak. It finally appears, the peak of chaos's horned beast. Tenses arise on each of the expedition's members as the beasts speak. Speak they are the leaders of the strange factory and they are Decahorn and Jiwon is having a full heart on to see that many horns in a single place to be his sword's food and everyone has their guard up, watching the tree of them slowly emerge from the dark. A voice came from a decahorn with an adult-sized body covered with silver metal. His name is Edsak, and he's sneering at Jiwon for having the courage to go to the abyss. On the contrary, Joniak is praising his bravery. This one was small, like a child, with its body covered in a bronze-colored metal. Then, I is speaking in a condescending tone, thinking that humans are lower beings. It was a woman-shaped decahorn and body covered in a metal-like skin. After observing them, Jiwon noticed they had power similar to higher-ranking Storm and Silence Monarchs, and he also knows it will be challenging to fight them at once. However, Chung Ho steps forward and mentions that he doesn't need to fight them. He had faced them a long time ago, and I has recognized him. Edsek warns her to be polite as if they had been waiting for them. He then points at Jiwon and asks him to enter because the great factory leader is waiting for him. Jiwon walks in with Chung Ho and Carlton. Inside the factory, many automatic machines clatter as they walk to a place where devices create horned monsters, and Carlton is impressed by it. Initially, everyone wanted to come in, but the Decahorns denied everyone else's access, which Jiwon forced them to accept, taking a few along. Then, the small Decahorns speak to Jiwon and introduce himself. Joniak then turns toward Garnak and says he shouldn't have killed Garnak because he only creates once every 10 years. Jiwon understood, but if that was the case, many of these monsters should have been lurking around. There weren't enough strong people who could fight these monsters, let alone kill them. Joniak answered that the dead demon warriors killed Garnak. Jiwon asked if it was true, and Joniak nods, confirming that they've been attacked by them and, fortunately won. Carlton added that he would have never considered seeing disciples of God in the abyss. Joniak is surprised that he would recognize what he is. So, Carlton stretched his hand, and a symbol appeared as he explains that he recognized him as the disciples of the god of machinery, Dias. Ayas chimed in, applauding the fact that Carlton knew about this. Not long after, they arrive at a gigantic gate, and announce that they'd arrive at the room of the great factor leader. He then opens the door, and a bright light pours out of the room, impressing Jiwon and his party. Inside the room, many screens display other worlds, and as Yiwen follows the Decahorns, he meets a giant figure covered in golden metal. 
he spoke politely, acknowledging the fact that Jiwan was the one who opened Genesis, and he used many gestures and expressions that made him look human. Jiwan notices Eniac written on his next and thinks that it must be his name. That name also sounds familiar to him. At one point, Jiwan saw something on the Decahorn's necks. It was the letters Edsek, Ayaz, and Joniak, as if they were written there to show the product name. Then he asks Eniac if he knows a planet called Earth. He stops and thinks about it. So, Jiwan adds that it's his home world, and in here, it's called World 294. Eniac's expression shifted. It seemed like he was even smiling, wondering why Jiwan asks about it. Jiwan thought the Decahorn's names were familiar, and now he remembered. He had learned these names when he was studying computers. Eniac is the name of the first computer ever to be created on Earth. That's why Jiwan thought that they had some connection. But Eniac replies that the god who created them came from a remote place in the dimension. He thinks that maybe that place was Earth. Jiwan became confused, and Eniac asked him about Abyss. He does manage to get a few pieces of information, but he doesn't have much information yet. When he doesn't answer, Eniac continues that Abyss is the land of the gods. If monarchs ruled the Almighty Land, the gods ruled the Abyss. There are a lot of gods that control the region and rule over them. As he talks about it, the place changes, making them feel like they're in augmented reality, and many maps and constellations appear in the air. Eniac tells them that this is the Abyss. Carlton is amazed at his surroundings, while Chung Ho concludes that the gods in the Abyss play the role of the monarchs. Eniac explains that they're similar but also different. Monarchs are adapters, but gods are different from them. Jiwon analyzed what he heard and asked again what is a god. Eniac became silent. Jiwon added that in his world, god was the word to describe the being that is almighty and all-knowing. Eniac laughs and then says he doesn't have the exact word or definition to describe what gods are, but he knows what kind of beings are called gods. He looks right at Jiwon and tells him that he is a god. Jiwon brushes off Eniac's hand that touches his shoulder and wonders what makes him a god. Eniac explains that he can be called gods in the abyss because he opened Genesis and became an Awaken who created the world. They can even be considered somewhat higher than gods in some instances. Unlike them, an Awaken does not require a representative to do their bidding. At that moment, a memory from the record of the depth was unlocked giving him more information. As he read the memory, he also listened to Eniac's words. He continues to say that all gods of the abyss require a representative as they cannot work alone. They exist because they let their representative or followers live in their world. The more followers they have, the more powerful they are. It reminds Jiwon of a world where their strength depends on their subscribers. Eniac added that it is rare for a human spirit like Jiwon to become a god, making him wonder how the other gods were born. So, Eniac explains that most gods represent the outcome of higher entities that obtained enough karma over a long period. Jiwon then remembered they were the demons or angels that cultivated products within towers, and they called themselves higher entities. They acquire karma, which is like volunteer points, through control. If they have enough karma points, Big Brother can allow them to be independent and receive their own world. Jiwon then realized that he had not asked an important question. He heard it from time to time, but he never cared to ask. The Big Brother. This is an entity that can permit one to become a god. But he doesn't understand why the Record of the Abyss has no information about Big Brother. When he asks about it, Carlton says that they are the organization that protects the system. And Chung Ho agrees as he looked around at the Decahorns. Eniac smiles bitterly and says he can consider it that way. To most humans, Big Brother is certainly that. Jiwon thinks Carlton and Chung Ho were not informed enough about Big Brother, hence their calmness. He asks Eniac if they were wrong. He then repeats himself that Big Brother is God among the gods who guard the system and prefers not to say any more than that. At last, it was an unanswered question, so Jiwon decided not to ask any further. Then Joniak sang a song about how scary Big Brother is. Edsek smacked his head, and he became silent. It was short, but there was a hint hidden within the song. Jiwon then realized why they were so sensitive about Big Brother. He asks if Big Brother killed their god. Joniak walked up to Eniac, rubbed his head, and confirmed his question. They lost their god to Big Brother and were expelled from the abyss. That is why they are here. Then, the memory was unlocked. Eniac's words had triggered some part of the abyss records. Jiwon closed his eyes to concentrate on the voices from the memory. After they lost their god, their power was still valuable, so they contracted Big Brother. It was Eniac from Mullark's memory. He asked Smolark to help find their titan warrior to break free from the contract. The voice was cut off from there. Jiwon then opened his eyes, already understanding most of their circumstances. Then Eniac tells him that he met him to keep him from going to the abyss. Jiwon realizes this is the real reason why they had called him up. Out of nowhere, Chung Ho says it's not their decision, triggering Aya's anger, but Eniac stops her before she can attack. Eniac explains that it's true they can't decide anything, but the ones who can decide will not accept them. There was only one being throughout all of Abyss that could decide, and it was called the Soul King. Jiwon wonders if the Soul King is angry at him for killing the Mega Dead. 
Eniac nodded. Magret, the mega dead he killed, was one of his favorite servants. Hearing it, Jiwon tries to summarize what happened. And it's pretty simple. The only one who could open the path to the abyss was Soul King Catastrophe. However, he was mad at Jiwon for killing one of his favorite pets. So, the angered king would not open the way for Jiwon. Still, despite all of that, Jiwon asks Eniac to open the door. He was determined to settle the score with him directly. But Eniac can't open the gate even if he wills it. Leaving Jiwon with no choice but to barge in. So he reaches for his sword. The air around them became tense as Jiwon began letting out the energy from his body. Aya's also released her energy and yelled that she was ready to fight at any time. Chungho and Carlton braced themselves, and Eniac also began focusing his energy. He couldn't dare to open the door to the dead man palace. It was better to fight Jiwon to stop him from going in rather than risking to open the door to the place. Before the fight broke loose, Jiwon mentions Deus Ex Machina. The air suddenly froze. Eniac was shocked to hear the unexpected name from Jiwon. But what came next was even more surprising. Jiwon offers that he will find the lost titan warrior and bring it to him if he opens the door. That offer throws Eniac off guard because no one knew about Deus Ex Machina in Abyss, but Jiwon had no intention of explaining where he had learned about it. He takes a few steps back, and his hand sparks before a virtual keyhole window appears. Eniac looked down, seemingly having no choice because he couldn't refuse the offer. His finger was shaped like a key. It was the key to the door of the disaster itself. Jiwon smirks, knowing his plan works. Once they entered the portal, he followed Eniac through the pitch black corridor. Jiwon only relied on the sound of his footsteps coming from the front to walk. He was concerned, but he did not express it. Eniac then says that he's never seen a human like him. He wonders if he really can persuade the Soul King. Jiwon did not answer. He was not sure at all. However, he was never sure about anything for everything he had done until now. In the end, Eniac wishes him good luck. Then he notices that Jiwon also has the stigma of Deus, but he's not using it. Jiwon lifts his arm where his serpent tattoo is. Eniac explained that they gave that seal to the humans. There are also seven horned guardian monsters along with it. But it seems that Jiwon's guardian horn has disappeared. But he's not sure where or why it's gone. Jiwon remembered that when he was given the seal, the previous master wasn't in the best state to do such a thing. It seemed that had resulted in an imperfect transfer. He also adds that if Jiwon activates that, from now on, horn beasts will never attack him. And if he finds any other apostles hiding within the abyss, this seal will help him get their help. After a long time, Eniac stops in front of the bridge and tells Jiwon that he must go alone from there. Jiwon looks at the bridge, which is made of wood and wires. It goes on for a long way, and the valley below is pretty deep. As a last advice, Eniac tells him that he needs to come back within an hour. If he cannot come within that time frame, he will have to seal the door. Jiwon nodded and walked toward the bridge. He never intended to stay in this place for too long so it wouldn't be a problem. As Jiwon walks through the bridge, Eniac remembers their conversation earlier, when he asked him if he could really persuade the Soul King. Jiwon said he's not sure, but he also had his reasons for doing it. After he came across the Abyss records, he had planned for this, and it's a way he must go through to destroy this world. And after a while, Jiwon arrived at the door. He realizes that this is the actual shape of the Palace of the Dead. It was made out of the horns of horned monsters, and that the entire corridor was made out of the same material. When Jiwon opened the door and walked in, the power inside immediately swept up to him. Then, a heavy voice can be heard welcoming him. Jiwon could now understand. This being was a king and the catastrophe itself. Even though it was only one phrase and a voice, Jiwon had to keep himself from being swept away by the force. He realized he had no chance of winning against this power. The king is throwing death threats at him for killing his servant. And Jiwon feels like he would choke even by just being watched. But he barely replies that he's not here to die. As he holds his sword that's planted firmly to the ground, he tells him that he's here to make a deal. Silence fell after that. In the next moment, laughter filled the dead man palace. The king couldn't believe that a lowly human like Jiwon dared to strike a deal with him. Despite the constant insult, Jiwon took a deep breath and spoke again. The king used to be first awakened, catastrophe, and the king of the chaos. He was once a god but got demoted into a mere king. And now, with all the power he possessed, he's nothing but a gatekeeper. Jiwon knew there was no going back after saying this. The plan that he thought up after getting the memory from Record of the Abyss required him to overcome this moment. The laughter stopped immediately. The surrounding energy began to spike, and Jiwon could barely fight back his fear. But Jiwon still asks why the king doesn't want to get back at the person who threw him out of the abyss and locked him in this evil place. Ultimately, he once again yells that he's here to make a deal. The power suddenly eased a bit, and Jiwon can enter the palace. The king is behind the closed door and thinks he's too arrogant but will hear him out. However, he warns Jiwon that he will not make it back alive if his deal isn't worth enough to compensate for his arrogance. Upon hearing it, dozens of monsters in the tower cheered for their king. 
But it doesn't scare Diwan because he knows the promise the king made with Mullark 900 years ago. Suddenly, the atmosphere had been altered to a point where Jiwon could feel it as well. The king wonders how he could know about it. However, Jiwon doesn't tell him anything. Instead, he offers to fulfill that promise and simultaneously be Mullark's successor. He knows his gamble is moving in his favor and he promises to bring him to the end of the abyss. At the same time, outside the factory, the expedition troops who were left behind are guarding the place. And Siren opened her eyes and frowned at the bright daylight. Yurin approached her and helped her up. Siren glanced around in confusion and wondered where they were. So he tells her that they're in front of the strange factory. Siren was then struck cold. If they were at the factory, they were now right before Abyss. She starts panicking and yells that she needs to stop Jiwon. Yurin is confused by Siren's panic and tells her that he's already inside. Meanwhile, some of the expeditionary troops saw some fireflies flying nearby, and they made the surrounding atmosphere warm. Kang Wang warns Yunyong, who's about to touch it, but he's too stubborn to listen. The fireflies exploded with great force when he was about to touch them. Everyone stood up in shock. No one had sensed any sign of attacks. Siren watches in horror, seeing the explosion made an impact on the strength factory building, and the people in the vicinity of the blast were burned to death by blue flames. People who can survive notice a few figures appear through the desert dust and recognize them as monarchs. As Jiwon requested, Sam Eung Han has come with his troops to fight against him. The expeditionary force began to prepare, although some were frightened at the appearance of the monarchs. When Han lets out his orders, Nok Myung starts to kill everyone except the Awaken and Adapters in the second stage and above. He's the one who has a grudge against ji and wants to meet him immediately and destroy him. On the other hand, Nishimoto finds it strange that Han is waging war to avenge Samyung Garam. He was sure that he was up to something. Nishimoto, who spoke telepathically, just wanted to investigate. Seeing the weak expeditionary force made Samyang Yua think bringing in 100 monarchs to fight a weak product was excessive. Yua did not expect to have another taste of death after 3000 years. He then asks Han if there was enough resurrection fruit for 100 people. Han smirked and replied that he didn't need to worry about that, as he was the first son of the Samyang family before becoming a strategist in Region 9. He will keep his promise. Besides, Yua just wanted to make sure that he would leave all the fruits of resurrection to his family. Hearing those words, Han felt like laughing, and it seemed that he was carrying out a cunning plan. He had lied to 100 monarchs that there were still enough resurrection fruits for them. He also felt bad for those who were deceived. But his lie would not be a lie anymore if he kept his promise. Since the beginning, he planned to enter the abyss and make a pact with the seven supreme gods to obtain the fruit of resurrection. This is the perfect timing because with Jiwon gathering everyone in this place, he got the awaken that the gods in Abyss desperately wanted to strengthen their power. Then, he ordered Vargas to search for the product without suspicious movements. If the other monarchs know the product's beauty, they will definitely try to steal it. Vargas immediately runs forward along with the others. Han also planned to create as many awakens as possible to be used as offerings to the supreme god in the Abyss to get the fruits of resurrection. He was enthusiastic about this plan and would make the Ninth Region into the new Resurrection Palace. With the monopoly of the fruit, the Ninth Region would become a place where monarchs were not afraid of death, and enemies would surrender to save their lives. He laughs out loud, thinking that his plan to control Almighty Land was perfect, but suddenly, an attack was directed at him. From a distance, he was furious when someone tried to attack him while he was having fun. With his power, Cayman tried to convince the expeditionary force to hold on. Knowing that their fortress master has important things to attend to, the trio, with everyone, put everything on the line to keep the enemy from entering the strange factory. Hysterically laughing, Sam Ung Han decides that it's time to end the fight and join the fray, landing himself in the middle of it. Han howled, asking the expedition members to bring Yu to him. That sends a wave of horror, stopping the fight for a moment. Immediately, he notices Siren, one that he sees as foolish to join the expedition. Siren knew that Han was among the most dangerous people in the Samyang family and did not expect a lieutenant general to come directly against them. As Han approaches the expedition group, he asks Nok Myung to rest because from now on, he will face them directly as the one responsible for this operation. The group simultaneously raised their energy and attacked Han in equal measure. With one swing of the sword, Han immediately engaged the attacks of Cayman and the others. Cayman didn't expect it. With just one swing of the sword, he was immediately bounced. Not only that, Han's sword is powerful enough to hit the firm walls of the factory building. He showed them the difference in strength. Then he said that the monarchs should fight them like this so they would not dare disobey again. Unexpectedly, Kang Wing's trembling hand still tried to stop Han even though he was helpless. Seeing their struggle makes him admit they have the courage to keep getting up, and he likes to see that. Ruthlessly, Han crushed Kang Wing's hand that was holding his leg. 
He was so excited when he could enjoy the suffering of those who were trying to get back on their feet. An hour passed after Jiwon and Eniak left for the Dead Man Palace. Chung Ho and Carlton felt an earthquake powerful enough to shake the whole factory. The Decahorn seemed to be surprised as well. With her contempt for humans, Ayaz thinks it's their doing because they can't sit still. But Edzak thinks differently, so Eniak tells Joniak to connect to the outside. Joniak nodded before closing his eyes, and energy rose from him and flew out. Moments later, he's trembling out of fear before he yells that the humans are in danger. Chung Ho is surprised because they're supposed to be safe. So he and Carlton looked at each other and quickly ran toward the entrance. It was apparent to them what was happening because Jiwon had warned them. Before they arrived at the factory, he warned them of this situation. Most of them thought he was too concerned with it. But they didn't think the monarchs would come all this way. And Chung Ho is sure that they want more than just Jiwon. They want to destroy and pillage on chaos, just like what they did 900 years ago. He recalled the events when the expeditionary force was slaughtered. He also remembers the young man who gave him the resurrection fruit and told him to say that their expedition was not a failure. After the expedition, he said that they did not fail everyone. But he felt that he had deceived himself and even had to endure the shame. And now the same thing was bound to happen again, and he can't accept that. However, what Cheng Ho saw at this time was the massacre of the expeditionary forces. The scene was horrible enough to resemble the disaster from 900 years ago. Cheng Ho glanced around and saw the leaders were almost on the verge of dying, with some awakens already dead. Carlton, who saw that Cheng Ho was very angry, tried to calm him down. Unfortunately, he immediately went up against them. Deep down beneath all that rage, he didn't want his former weak self to be a burden to the expedition this time and decided to advance against them. The group of people in front of him can't even see him coming until he already knocks them all down. He's looking for Mukuk and Kamen, and when he comes across them, he's shocked. Yang screamed in pain as he lost two eyes. Kang Wing moaned with his one arm cut off. Mukuk fell down because he lost his leg, and Yuren knelt as he held onto his waist. Meanwhile, Kamen couldn't do anything after Han beat him up, and dozens of wounds covered his body. Han then glanced at Siren. She shook in fear, hearing him getting agitated because no one would tell him where Jiwon was. When everybody was still silent, he quickly focused his energy on his sword, intending to kill Kaiman and make him an example. He was heavily injured and barely standing, but his eyes were clear. Chung Ho shouted to stop Han from killing Kaiman. And before Han's attack hit him, Kaiman had a little flashback of himself in the past to stay strong like now and apologize to Jiwon for having to leave first. Suddenly, two figures came rushing against Han's sword while pulling Kaiman back. Siren was quite panicked when she saw Chung Ho and Carlton trying to help them by attacking Han. However, even both of them combined weren't enough to fight off a commander's sword. But it was enough to twist its direction, which allowed them to take everyone away. Looking at them closely, Han felt more and more attracted to them. Chung Ho was shocked to feel the terrifying spirit power just from talking, and he felt sorry for Kamen, who continued to fight a monster like him. But before he could do anything, a flash of lightning came from behind Han. They're the Decahorns from inside of the factory. And Edsek asks what the meaning of this is. Han holds himself back and replies that he wants to take his escaped product, and then he will leave. Edsek asked if the product was an Awaken who had opened Genesis. He thinks that the monarchs had remained the same for thousands of years and regarded a human as a product. Han shrugged off the slander and wanted them to open the factory gates for him immediately. Edsek asked what his purpose was because the time was not right. He couldn't believe what he heard, and it seemed like an excuse. Knowing that peaceful conversation will not get him anywhere, he glares at Edsak and orders him to open the door, threatening them with his extremely powerful aura, sending shockwaves outward. Edsak calmly reminded Han that the monarchs were not allowed to create chaos in the factory. Han knew they were here to suppress the power of the sealed soul king. He's known to be the ancient three gods. Such a being needed twelve monarchs to join forces to seal it away and earn a title as the strongest god in the abyss. But Han doesn't know how potent that soul king is. The twelve previous monarchs weren't as strong as they are now, and he was convinced that he was stronger than the twelve monarchs thousands of years ago. Edzak thinks Han's pride went too far, so he tells him to give up his plan. But Han is cocky and says he'll never pay attention to what a tin can says. That makes Ayaz angry that she aggressively attacks him even though Edzak tried to stop her. Han says that it was too late as he had already prepared his attack. A symbol emerges from the spell he had prepared and makes a powerful attack. A beast also emerges from the spell and is now standing behind Han. Ayaz, who was standing in front of the beast, couldn't do anything because the beast's attack was so massive. The attack had a huge impact, making the other monarchs shocked. Chung Ho couldn't believe what he was seeing right now was reality. Yunyong suddenly asked him about the current situation, wondering if they still had a chance to win. Seeing that Yunyong couldn't see anymore, Chung Ho wasn't sure if he could answer because they couldn't defeat the monster in front of them. However, he suddenly remembered Xia Lihua's words that he would continue to run away and leave them. He feels terrified remembering that. 
He even wonders how Jiwon could continue to endure and fight against strong men like this while thinking he would win every time. Then Yunyong asked again if their fortress master still hadn't come. Chengo feels that Jiwon might have died when he met the Soul King, but he knows that their master would definitely not bow down and give up. He assures Yunyong that even if their master hadn't returned, they could continue fighting because they hadn't lost. Yunyong was both relieved and terrified as he shed tears. He couldn't see, but he still rose to stamp. The other members slowly rose at once, too. Kangwing was without his left arm, Mukuk was without his right leg, and Yurin had a huge cut on his waist. Han looked at them in astonishment. He had shown them the power beyond imagination. A power that is enough to make them cower in fear, but somehow, they still have a will to fight. He was astonished, and he came to fear them at the same time. It was as if they were silently telling him that they didn't care who their enemy was, even if they were monarchs. That makes him wonder if all awakens born with the tower are like this and if he could sell them to the abyss. He decides to change the plan and tells Vargas to kill them all. What's important was the product and the tower that was made by it. The others were irrelevant. Han's monster prepared its attack and aimed at Cayman and the others. However, a distant attack suddenly fights off the attack. This surprises Han because of how strong the counterattack that quickly overpowers his monster. But then he becomes thrilled when he sees the product he had been looking for finally showing itself. Tattered and beaten up, Jiwen apologizes to his army for showing up late. A ray of hope finally shines, surprising Chun Ho and the others with his sudden appearance. Right after, Jiwon gives out an order to all of the expedition party to leave as soon as possible. Meanwhile, after seeing the product he'd been looking for, Han couldn't believe that the weak and hostile person in front of him was the Gorgon Fortress Master. He didn't expect to be brought in just for someone like him. Plus, the dirty energy from his encounter with the Soul King made him think that the king had begun to soften for letting someone like Jiwon come back alive. Moreover, he's very disappointed that the person Chaos trusted is just a beggar-looking human. On the other hand, seeing Jiwon look like a homeless person makes Magata and Serum disappointed because it makes them feel like fools. Yua asks Han if he brings them just for this product. Han is sure they think too highly of themselves, but he assures them that they are all needed here. Before getting the fruit of resurrection, he was not sure he could persuade the Soul King to open the door to him. That's why he wants to bring all of them to forcefully break the Abyss door if he doesn't get the Soul King's permission. At that moment, Jiwon began unleashing his energy. He's tired of listening to their chatter, and soon enough, his world begins to unfold in front of the monarchs. Nakmyeon, who saw the unique world, was intrigued. On the top of the tree of imagery was the Eye of Asura with crows flying around and corpses strewn everywhere. Migata feels that the big eyes look like the first nightmare, but Serum thinks it looks more like Big Brother. While Yua didn't care how unique the world was because a world without life was nothing, Chung Ho didn't know what Jiwon was planning, but he knows that his power isn't enough to fight lieutenant generals alone. Suddenly, Han says this was still mediocre compared to the people from the crack. He also asks if this is the extent of his abilities. Jiwon, of course, said no and immediately attacked Han using his unique sword. However, Serum quickly cancels his attack with just a kick and simultaneously pushes him back. Feeling that this fight was too easy, he asked Han to let him fight Jiwon alone. But Han stopped him because he would fight him himself. Because he feels like he should clean up his own mess from now on. Nakmyung steps forward and offers to join in. Still, Han refuses his help and builds a dome-shaped barrier with a snap of his fingers so that no one can disturb their fight. This makes Nakmyung angry that he would not allow him to get revenge, but Han calmly tells him to get some rest instead. Jiwon asks him what he will do, but he replies that he just feels generous to give a present to someone brave like him. Han was sure that Jiwon would be satisfied with a one-on-one -on -one fight. Moreover, he also doesn't like to be disturbed. With his blue flame power, Han invited Jiwon to attack him with all his strength, even though the attack was just a joke to him. Jiwon unceremoniously launched his attack, but Han easily dodged it. He asks if Jiwon has no cheap tricks, but Jiwon suddenly prepares to attack him from the side. Unfortunately, the attack was read by Han and made him quickly reverse Jiwon's attack. In the middle of their fight, he exclaims that in the past six months, he had fought against ten Awakens, some of whom had reached the fourth stage. But for him, Jiwon is the weakest Awaken among the fourth stage Awakens he fought. As he said it, he landed a punch on Jiwon's chest and sent him flying a few feet back. His crushing attack is much more powerful than Samyung Garam. Although Garam was the equivalent of a lieutenant general, Han was on a different level. Jiwon realizes that a half-hearted attack wouldn't work, so he combines his two swords like fighting Garam back then. Seeing that, Han started to manifest his monster and hoped his attack would not disappoint this time. With all his might, Jiwon gathered the power in his thrusts. The thrust was aimed at Han's beast, which surprised him. Even the thrust made a loud impact on Han's barrier. Chung Ho, who's outside, was surprised by the explosion. But the other monarchs felt it was just a cheap triumph. Seeing that Jab made Han knows why he defeated Garam. 
But Han warned Jiwon that his level with Garam was much different. He wanted to end this soon, but before that, he asked if Jiwon still had something to show. So, Jiwon asked what he was planning to do because he should be able to kill him right away. Han was impressed with Jiwon's quick response. Han wanted Jiwon to come to Region 9 with his artificial tower. He asked what if he refused, but Han didn't give him a firm answer. And when Jiwon looked up, he was pretty surprised by what Han showed him. He's sure that what he saw was the computer of his world. Seeing that reaction makes Han very happy, but he wants to give him a special gift. Then Jiwon was even more surprised when he saw his body, breathing shallowly without a word and in a deep sleep. It was the body that embodied his spirit for 20 years on Earth. And Han offers him the chance to get back to the life he had lost. He is even going to make him the 8th commander. But it's not only that. Han continued to say that he would rewind his time as well. And with that, the scene changed. It shows a place with many high-story buildings, with crowds walking below. That was his home. However, Jiwon refuses to go back in time. Han laughs, knowing that he is going to say this. He had been gathering a lot of information about Jiwon, and it was the sight of him refusing to return to start the game again. But he's not offering for him to go back in time. Besides, by doing so won't make all the horrors and nightmares he faced disappear. Jiwon did not answer, but he knew Han was right. Then he adds that he will still have scars, and all the memories he had faced, even if he went back in time, can't be forgotten. They're what shaped Jiwon into who he is today. When Jiwon heard it, he couldn't say anything. He even agreed with what he said. No one else in the world knew as much as this enemy did. On top of that, what Han is offering is a present time, but not here where he had to look out for people. Jiwon looks around and when Han tells him he can return to the time when he lost everything, he sees the video that shows a woman reading a book to a child, and Jiwon knew who she was. For the first time, there was sadness on his face when he saw his mom again. Han smiled because he knew humans well. They all had longings or the feeling of something that had been lost. So, if Jiwon is willing to accept the position as a lieutenant general of the 9th region, Han will make sure he can return to that time. Han is confident that Jiwon would accept the offer. However, to his surprise, Jiwon refuses to return and will go up to the top, making Han wonder if he is really willing to throw the people he loves into the trash and simultaneously begin to imbue himself with azure-colored aura, sending Shockwave around, proving how powerful Samyang Han is. Jiwon thought it might be true that he missed those on Earth because he still had human feelings. He wants to go back and see his family, but the past, future, or present doesn't matter in this world. He immediately launches his powerful attack on Han, which even hits the barrier because of how powerful the attack is and sends Tremor outside of it. Once the dust settles, Jiwon adds that he might be happy if he returns, but they will return and start the cultivation anyway. Han's sword sparked with blue azure fire when he launched his attack, sending Jiwon several steps back from the impact. For him, cultivation is the natural way of this world, and Jiwon can do anything to stop it. As Jiwon holds his sword to keep him from being thrown by the force, he thinks he knows everything that has happened. In this world, cultivation is the law of the world, and it isn't anyone's fault. It's not Cayman's fault to forget his past or Siren, who was born in the tower. Even angels or demons who participated in cultivation couldn't be blamed. He blames the world that did not specify it as a problem, and that's why he must destroy it. Han calls him a fool for being so naive when everything he loves is a part of this world. He also adds that the system can't be destroyed. At last, he intends to end his fight against Jiwon. Seeing his powerful force, Jiwon knows he doesn't have time to get strong or strengthen his world. So he takes out a red crystal and determines to fight anyway. If he can't defeat him with his own strength, he needs to borrow it from a stronger power, and he eats the red crystal. When Han's big attack finally reaches him, Chung Ho and Carlton can see glimpses of a power blast, but have no idea what's really happening. Han realizes Jiwon will not obey them, so the best option is to kill him. Besides, even though he dies here, he will still rise back to his main body. He only needs to send Jiwon back to the Almighty Land forcefully. When Jiwon opens his eyes, a red crimson aura starts to pour out of his body. The summoned creature that brightly radiates blue flame slowly gets invaded by the power that Jiwon summoned, as well as his barrier slowly getting consumed by the red azure energy, and his surprised face was exposed to corruption. Everyone who was outside the barrier asked what was going on. And with the energy coming out of the barrier, Chung Ho knew the reason why Jiwon didn't eat the horn properly was to use this much power. A portal containing the ghoul suddenly appeared, and Han was seen laughing when the corruption spread in his body. With the barrier slowly turning red, he wonders if Jiwon knows about the consequences of doing this. Then, the space was destroyed. Everyone is shocked when a man walks through the Palace of the Dead. He looked like Jiwon, but he was no longer him. 
It is the Soul King who is very ecstatic to be finally free and to be able to descend once more into chaos. A message from nowhere appears, asking what is going on in chaos. Some can feel the energy of the three ancient gods and begin to speculate that the seal has been broken. Meanwhile in another strange place with a giant head and a pool of blood, a mysterious man feels the same thing happening in chaos, revealing that he knows Sialha, a member of Crack that is stationed in chaos. Back at the factory, multiple giant monsters are surrounding the Soul King who is sitting on his throne with Han, who is standing trembling in front of him. He wonders how the king can break free after being sealed by the twelve monarchs. He was very sure that it was written in the Akashi record. Hence, he felt that bringing 100 monarchs here would be an overkill. But now, even if the pitch darkness monarchs were here, they wouldn't necessarily be able to fight the soul king. So, he says to the king that he doesn't intend to fight against him and wants to take the product that he possesses. The king only smirks and refuses to give Jiwan. Han reminds him that he made a promise to Big Brother not to interfere in Chaos Affairs. That makes the Soul King furious with Han for mentioning Big Brother and his power scattered across the land. Han immediately apologized because he knew that the king didn't seek a proxy because of this deal. However, Jiwon is not his proxy. He wants to protect his world even if he has to sacrifice his life. And that's why they made a contract. Han wants to ask what contract that they made, but the king replies that it's none of his business while preparing to unleash his power. He created a large tornado storm, and he was even able to manipulate a giant tsunami with his power. The other monarchs were shocked by his power. Then the Soul King says that everyone in this place will die. Han asks if he wants to break the promise he made with Big Brother. And the king says that the power is his, but the will is not. Waves of tornado and tsunami shook the monarchs in front of the king. And the waves of tornado and tsunami began coming down on the commanders. Han immediately tells everyone to gather. He realized it was Jiwon who called upon catastrophe to create this disaster. He also learned that Jiwon's body was in a very unstable state, meaning his imperfect dissension will not last long. Han whispers to the commanders that they can win if they can hold for a few minutes. But Nokmyung refuses to join the fight and fled. The king who see him leaving didn't just let him go because he knew that they were trying to imitate his world. After binding him with his power, the king claims that none of the monarchs in here is worthy enough to be a ghoul. So, he intended to kill them all. The tsunami makes the monarch screams for help. And with a joyful smile on his face, the soul king tells Han to see the disaster that he had brought on himself. Han was frustrated to see all the plans he had devised fail miserably. But he refuses to give up, and with a strong slash, Yua tells him that it's not over yet. Serum is also trying to convince others that they can win if they fight back together. Seeing so many people attacking makes the king happier, and Han is able to get his spirit back. Led by Yoa and Serum, the monarchs began to try to escape the disaster that the king had spawned. The battle between the monarchs and the ghoul happens in the midst of it all. Seeing many people fight together, Han feels that they can win even if they have to endure a significant loss. He's sure with such a big attack, the Soul King will definitely be overwhelmed, and they also don't know the end of this fight yet. The Soul King is delighted to see this many people draining their energy to survive. However, with just one snap of the fingers, a powerful attack passed Han by unceremoniously. That attack destroyed Yua and Serum in one fell swoop. Han, who saw it, seemed to be confused by what had just happened in front of him. It only took five minutes for all generals to be wiped out. Then the king said that it would be very dull if he sit and watch quietly, making Han, who was very surprised by what had just happened, started laughing like crazy. He wondered whether, from the start, they didn't have a way to beat the Soul King. He admitted his loss, but he wouldn't let Jiwon's plan go his way. The Soul King is happy that he can finally have fun after a long time and immediately uses his power to punch a hole in Han's body. Even though he was satisfied but, he was starting to get bored of using his power on them. Soon, the disaster he made starts to stop along with Jiwon, who's still on the throne, and Han lay on the ground. Jiwon feels the power surging within him and thinks this is the true power of the Soul King. It was a power he was experiencing through his own body, but he didn't feel that it was realistic. It's not at the level of just destroying the lands and the world but they are controlling the world itself. That was the true power of the Master of Chaos. Jiwon knew that this power was the goal he had to strive for. What's more important was that this power wasn't everything the king had. And even then, he lost a big brother and was sealed away. So he asks how strong he needs to become. The king tells him that he's so weak that he can't hold him and survive for five minutes during the possession. And since he's not the king's proxy, he can only summon him three times. Jiwon used it once this time, so he only had two more chances. However, the king knows Jiwon will need him when he meets Big Brother, so that means he only has one chance. He also reminds Jiwon to keep his promise and not die when the ghoulification hits him. After the connection between the king and Jiwon is gone, Jiwon felt horrible pain gripping him. He knows his spirit is at the limit. 
He also saw darkness grasping him and tentacles coming out of him. He can feel his memories fading away, and he is starting to lose himself. He then wished if something could be there to kill him before he becomes a ghoul. When he's drowning in the sea of his subconscious, he suddenly sees his memories being filled up. It shows him when Cayman asks Chung Ho what he likes from their master, which makes him want to take part in the expedition. Chung Ho said that he didn't like Ji Wan at all because he only knew how to kill and torture. On top of that, he's reckless, foolish, and childish. But even then, Chung Ho never hated him, and he didn't want him to be alone. That memory makes Ji Wan come back to his senses when ghoulification is about to take over. Chung Ho has done a ghoul slash to save Ji Wan and calls him repeatedly to wake him up. Hearing Ji Wan calling him an old man makes Chung Ho feel grateful. He asks why did he recklessly use that power and risked himself becoming a ghoul. Apparently, Jiwon had made up his plan with Chung Ho in mind. With his ghoul slash, Jiwon thought there was a chance for Chung Ho to prevent him from becoming a ghoul. Chung Ho, who was moved by what he said, wanted to hug Jiwon. But Jiwon immediately stops him. At the end of the fight, which was so tiring, he asks whether this was all over. The expedition troops suffered heavy losses. But there are still quite a lot of members who survived. And Jiwon is sure that chaos will be safe because the monarch would not care about the chaos anymore as they would be busy rebuilding what they had lost. When he thinks that everything is over, a few people come to him with disappointed faces. Jiwon turned to where Han was and remembered that he was about to mess up his plan. One of the members is James, who holds a block containing a video of Jiwon's body that is still alive, making him wonder if Jiwon is actually a living soul. Chung Ho tries to stop them because Jiwon dared to sacrifice his own life for them. James ignores him and asks if Jiwon had lied about not getting the fruit of resurrection and kept it for himself. Cayman tries to give them an explanation. But James cuts him off with an angry face and tells him that the video is a solid proof that Jiwon is alive. Yuren tries to be the mediator, but things escalate too quickly. He feels this is very bad because the people are following Jiwon so they can get their lives back and are not interested in changing the world. So, the fact that Jiwon is alive makes all the emotions within them immediately explode. Hearing from afar, Jiwon knows that they will definitely question that because everyone in chaos is dead. And then suddenly, they figure out that the leader they trust turns out to be alive. Han, who's still alive, apparently uses confusion to see Jiwon in a pathetic condition. This skill can only be used if there is something underlying the envy or doubt that will increase their emotions. Seeing the expedition troops who once respected Jiwon starting to hate him makes Han very happy. Even though his plan failed, at least he can see that Jiwon's plan failed as well. When Kamen tries to explain that he's the one who destroyed all the fruits, Jiwon stands up and claims that he's the one who did it. Everyone is surprised by that statement, even Siren can only remain silent. James guessed that Jiwon dared to do it because he was still alive, and it disappointed him. While deep down, Jiwon wants to tell them that using the fruit won't change anything but he thinks that it's useless to say that. What he wants to do now is to clarify whether he's still alive or not by bringing out his unique world. Jiwon wants them to see it for themselves through his brain link. Seeing the strain of the link, James immediately says that Jiwon is indeed still alive, and has been deceiving them all this time. But instead of being angry, several people look surprised at what Jiwon is going to do. Jiwon says that he doesn't care about the real or fake life, but he can show the one thing. While he breaks his brain link, he states that this is the life he chooses. Everyone is surprised that Jiwon breaks his own brain link. Then, unexpectedly, Han broke the silence with his laughter. Everyone turned to look at him in shock. They didn't expect him to still be alive. But his spirit was now fading away into a silvery powder, and he disappeared. People then lost the energy to stand and slumped down. Mental shock struck them, and their minds calmed down as Han's skill was deactivated, and they realized what they had just done. Jiwon looked at each and every one of them, and they're all silent. James loses his will to speak up. Jiwon walks past him and begins walking, limping from the damage he acquired through becoming a ghoul. James asks him where he's going next, and he says that he's going to the abyss. Soon, a few members stood and followed Jiwon. It was those who were not suspicious of Jiwon from the start. Chung Ho was the first, then came Carlton. Siren then glanced around and quickly followed Jiwon, who was going back to the factory. Yurin looks sad, remembering that from the start, Jiwon is always alone. Without a word or a goodbye, everyone is silent and feels the same thing when Jiwon starts to walk away. And with that, beginning with Cayman, the other leaders started kneeling. Even though there will always be a new king in chaos, everyone knows there is only one king whom they will always recognize. Yuan is the true king of chaos who has now left chaos. Three months after he left, the atmosphere of chaos has significantly changed with a giant statue resembling him. Nino, who has been asleep all this time, gets a story from Claire about what happened in chaos, thanks to the agreement between the king of humans, the strange factory leader, and the soul king. Chaos was successfully united and built a fort near the ruins of the factory with the name Carp Deem. 
humans, ghouls, and horned beasts that used to fight each other now all coexist together within the fortress. However, there are several new factions that rejected the unity in chaos. These factions were none other than from the Almighty Land, where the Ninth Region is located. Because of Jiwan's Monarch Massacre incident, the Ninth Region became the target of war and caused thousands of monarchs to die every day. Fortunately, the Tower of Nightmare left behind by Jiwan made Chaos able to produce strong awakens to fight the monarchs. But they still find it difficult to fight with major general monarchs that are stronger than 10th stage adapters. Thankfully, this has been overcome because of the factory leader came up with a brilliant plan. The Adapter Monarchs, which previously appeared in the Resurrection Palace, has now been replaced by the factory leader in Carp Deem. At first, Mina was worried that it might spike another problem, but she was convinced after hearing the reason for doing so. The monarchs who died will appear in front of the Soul King's Gate. They are supposed to be in the Resurrection Palace and wait for their turn to get the fruit to return to the Almighty Land. But once they arrive now, they become tribute to the Soul King's boredom. Chaos that had not changed for thousands of years has now drastically changed since Jiwon's arrival. She reached into her pocket and felt the return stone. Claire said that Yuan visited her before he left for the factory and gave the stone in her hand. It makes her wonder why he saved Chaos. Yuan, as she knew him, was cold and uncaring. He doesn't like humans and has no reason for saving the world. Then, Mina remembers her last words before she fainted a long time ago. She told him to not give up on this world. However, she brushes that idea off because there must be other reasons. Then she stopped at the entrance of the tower along with other people. She felt something filling her heart. She realizes why the expression on people's faces wasn't as dark as they entered. It was hope. There was hope that there was something in this world that she could do. And that thought makes her smile. The man who was trying to put an end to this world left hope instead. That makes her think that this is another kind of ending. She then looked up to the sky, believing that Yuan was surely fighting in another world. And wonders when she can meet him again. She couldn't understand the kind of world Yuan pictured, but she could imagine. And within her imagination, the world was a small tree, a lone tree with no leaves or land to grab onto. But Mino didn't think the tree was lonely. Even if the whole world turned its back on it, Jiwon was surely beside it to protect it. It was the world that he will always protect and the name of that place is the world after the end. Currently, Jiwon is making his way to the abyss. It was known as the branch of the illusion tree, and the area in it is called a site. And each site has its own unique world. Among the gods in the abyss, seven great gods are the highest ranking who control all the worlds in inside. Though somewhere in one of these sites, there lies a blue forest area. Ronald is walking alone in the middle of the forest while asking his goddess, namely the great naked Anderson, whether or not the fishing place is actually here. There were only trees and grass, and the atmosphere each time the bush shook with the wind, he flinched in fear. Anderson tells him to believe in her, but Ronald had looked for a long time but still couldn't find it. He suggested to just going back before they meet Dark Soul. Anderson replies that the possibility was very low because in over 100,000 years since the three ancient gods have fallen. This means they didn't have a lot of followers and were probably dead by now. And besides, Ronald doesn't need to worry one bit, even if they appear because he got her. But deep down, he's doubtful about that. However, he had no other choice but to look for new followers for Anderson because the number of followers determines the power of God. The more followers, the more power the god obtained. It allowed them to make a more powerful world or use rare settings or items in its world. So, he had to help Anderson look for new followers, or her world will disappear. Ronald suggests inviting more followers by negotiating. But Anderson refuses because they just want to steal their belongings like yesterday. Not only that, the other gods also started to be wary of them because they were trying to steal their followers. Ronald finally had no other choice but to fish up lost human souls in the abyss. Usually, there are very common fishing spots for the gods. But there are times where remote areas like this have undiscovered fishing spots. Seeing that they haven't found anything, Ronald begins to question her sources. Anderson says she bought the information from Minerva's shop. Ronald falls on his knees after knowing that his goddess has bought prophecy from the goddess of luck. Not to mention that Anderson paid for it using all their remaining money. Seeing that he's about to have a meltdown, Anderson asks him to calm down because the luck is in the northwest of Caspian, namely blue forest and water. She believes the water should indicate that it's the fishing place. Ronald gets angrier because Anderson only got that bit of information after paying the goddess of luck for 300 trusts. He wants her to realize her mistake and it will be best for them to go back but he also feels that he's too cruel to Anderson. In the end, she only did it out of desperation since she had no other followers except Ronald as his avatar. And because of that, Anderson's world seemed to fade into nothing slowly. Eventually, Ronald decides to search the location a little longer, and he makes excuses that he wants to have a junior, making Anderson very happy. Ronald always feels like he hears the voice of his long-lost little brother when talking to his goddess. Ronald stopped suddenly because he smelled something. He first thought he was mistaken. 
but as he tried again, it wasn't mistaken at all. He can smell water nearby and asks Anderson to follow him. Ronald began searching around. When the smell becomes stronger, he immediately runs through the bushes. And after a while, they found a small open space in the forest. There was a small silvery pond at the center. Ronald and Anderson had found a new fishing place. They're thrilled, and Ronald is glad because their tiredness has paid off. He's very enthusiastic when they are finally able to get new followers. And Anderson is happy as well because she wants to immediately get a lot of followers, change the story, and buy tons of items. An hour later, Ronald asks if fishing usually takes a lot of time. Anderson is sure that fishing requires patience. After three hours, nothing's coming up. And just like that, the day went by until Ronald looked like he was about to die from dehydration. Because he's been waiting for a soul to take the bait without moving. Out of frustration, he asks Anderson to beat up the goddess of luck. However, she's a top-ranking god, and Anderson has no chance of winning if they fight. Ronald became sad. They finally found a new fishing place, but they weren't catching anything. That makes him think that maybe this fishing place was found a long time ago but was abandoned because nothing could be fished. Suddenly, Anderson tells him that she just saw his fishing line move. Ronald then turned to the fishing pole, and at that moment, the pole suddenly moved, and Ronald felt something heavy pulling the bait. At last, he had caught something. Most spirits were fished up the moment they were caught, but this spirit didn't look normal. For once, this has such great spirit power. Anderson also felt something off because this spirit wasn't from the border but chaos. Ronald quickly held the fishing pole in his mouth and began to undress himself. Then, he asks Anderson to activate her fable. And as her fable activated, Ronald's scrawny body turned into that of a muscled man. Ronald is prepared to pull his fishing pole out by gathering all of his strength. After a while of heavy pulling, something was dragged outside. It was an unconscious man. He had dark hair, with wounds all over the body. Ronald became shocked and quickly asked Anderson what have they fished up. Anderson answered that this man had his own world, and she realized that they had just fished up a god. She's sure of it, and even if he's not a god, he must have the power equivalent to a god. After hearing it, Ronald is more convinced that the man is not a god, because god doesn't have a physical body. All gods exist in the abyss and only become themselves through their followers and can only appear through their avatar. Ronald asks Anderson if it is possible that the man is an avatar or follower of another god because he can sense his world power. That's when Ronald suddenly feels something strange about the man they've just fished up. Considering that this man was from chaos, it didn't make sense for him to be a follower or an avatar where there was no god. But Anderson had a different idea. There was one terrifying god within chaos. One that might be stronger and more terrifying than any of the top-ranking gods from the abyss. But she decided not to spill that part of the information. Ronald still wants to confirm whether the man is really a god. Since it's not always the case that animals that don't resemble mice are cats. He wants to know what Anderson has been hiding from him. Because Anderson said, she was a god. Then, Anderson tells him a story about a strong rat that is unique and different from other rats. In general, rats scavenge leftover food, but this rat went out to hunt. When the rat realized that it was stronger, it became something more. Eventually, it was strong enough to even fight against a cat. But this fact also made other mice afraid of him and his natural predator makes it an opponent and not a prey. Finally, the rat was given the nickname The Awaken. Ronald felt a sudden jolt. He knew Awakens very well. Those beings that broke their limits as humans can become gods, and they can create their own worlds and become the representatives of their own worlds. A creature that can fight the system is the only being that can reach the level of divinity, but still have a physical body is called the Awaken. It all made sense now, but Ronald still asks whether the man is an Awaken like the terrorist group from the crack. Anderson is still not sure because they still haven't examined him. She thinks that they can make him a companion or eat him, depending on the situation, after proving their theory before the man wakes up. Ronald hopes that the man is not a god because he wants him to be a follower with him or maybe become an avatar. But if they eat him, he hopes that the man doesn't hate them. Then, he places his hand on the man's chest and begins to dive into his spirit. Cannibalism between the gods often occurs in wild areas like Caspian. This was forbidden in many sites, but it was another way for gods to increase their power rather than gathering followers. If Anderson determines that this man is a god, she will start eating up his spirit right away. There was no better prey than an unconscious one. However, Ronald hoped not to lose the chance of gaining new friends. He had been lonely through his time with only his goddess. But seeing the man held a great world power, the spirit would become Anderson's new avatar instead. When he's examining the man, he realized something wasn't right. Anderson's link that was connected to him is suddenly being cut off. However, Ronald feels that this is not just their relationship that has been cut off. He screams and calls for his goddess, but there is no answer. And Ronald doesn't know that there was a bigger problem than Anderson's vanishment. There are suspicious people lurking in the forest, trying to approach him. 
With a scared expression, Ronald feels that this is not a simple link disconnect because he can't feel his god's presence anymore. Before all of this, when Soul King showed Jiwon and the others to follow on the road to the abyss, Jiwon knew that they would enter the territory of the gods and he felt that they had to be careful, because even the monarchs were afraid to enter. He was grateful that the members he wanted to bring were trustworthy and good enough. It was a shame that he couldn't take Cayman with him, but that was for the best. He ordered Cayman to stay behind in chaos because they still needed someone to lead them, and Yuan thought Cayman was the best candidate. But suddenly, smoke blocked their view and separated Jiwon from the others. Jiwon was shocked by what was happening because he couldn't feel the energy of his comrades and also the Soul King. It turns out that was the work of Siala and her partner, who wants to discuss something with him. He knows from Chung Ho that the woman is the captain of Crack, Yu Siala. She's at least as powerful as Lieutenant General. Jiwon asks what she's planning, but Siala wants him to calm down but her partner wants her to finish the business immediately because his barrier against the Soul King won't last for long. She tells Jiwon that the crack was always watching him, and they didn't expect he would involve the Soul King in the fight with the monarchs. He asked, what is her point? Because he knew Siala wasn't friendly when she had set this barrier around them. If she were coming in friendly, she wouldn't have forced it upon them like this. Siala replies that she wants Jiwon to join the crack because his goal isn't too different from them. The reason why they just thought of asking him to join is because Jiwon can use Link Disconnect, which can only be used by captains and the leader of the crack. Jiwon asks if the technique can only be used by the crack. Siala replies it is a dangerous skill that can perish spirits, and it's not something that awakens who aren't from crack should be allowed to use. Hearing it made Jiwon understand what she meant. If he doesn't want to die, then he should join the crack. But he knew nothing would change if he had accepted her offer, so he refused. With that said, his relationship with the crack was decided. Siala raises her scythe and asks if he still wants to fight with a body that's on the verge of death. However, her partner warns her to stop immediately because the barrier will soon disappear, and if they get hit by a link disconnect, they're going to be trapped there. But with an angry face, Siala warns him not to underestimate her ability. She finally decides to leave and says that Jiwon will regret his decision. Seeing her leaving, Jiwon was grateful because he could have died if he had fought her, and he also felt lucky this time. But he has wasted a lot of time because of them and the door to the abyss finally closed. Luckily, Chengo and the others managed to get in first because they would definitely meet in the abyss. However, the problem was that Jiwon didn't know to go there now that the door had closed. He felt that his body was no longer able to move properly because he was tired, and he felt like he could faint at any time. The Soul King thinks that Jiwon is very troublesome, and he tells him to follow the closest light he sees. Jiwon wants to know what it means, but the king says that he will eventually realize it. And if he's lucky, he might wake up in the abyss. Jiwon had no choice, and soon, he seemed to be drowning in water. But he felt pretty calm, like a fish swimming peacefully. It was then that he regained his consciousness and saw the light appear from above. Jiwon realized he should move towards it. Then, a woman with blue skin shouts at him to wake up and surprise him. He wasn't sure what was going on. When he looked around, he only found darkness. But it wasn't like the darkness from the path to the abyss. After he checked the eye of Asura in the sky, he realized he was inside his unique world. But then another question arose. Who is the woman who woke him up and suddenly blamed him? He asks her about who she is and why she is here. The woman replies that she's Anderson and one of the gods in the abyss. But she's very sad because he just ate her. 